and I'm the field manager for Penn Future and Conservation Voters of PA, two statewide environmental advocacy organizations. Uh, we're joined here tonight with We Conserve PA, the Choose Clean Water Coalition, and the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. And we are very excited tonight to have you all here for our budget briefing, where we're gonna be talking about how uh, this year's state budget will impact um, uh, you and your communities um, throughout the, uh, the state. A few housekeeping uh, notes before we get started. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared in a follow-up e email. So please make sure to keep an eye out for that. We are also gonna be offering live transcription services um, if you prefer that. Uh, finally, we will be having a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. Um, and so if you have any questions at any time, please use the Q&A function to submit uh, questions as that will be the quickest way for us to um, collect those questions and submit it to our great panelists. It's now my great honor to introduce Matt Stepp, Interim President and CEO of Penn Future and Molly Parson, Executive Director of CBPA, to give a few remarks about the historic nature of this year's state budget. Matt, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. And thanks to all the organizations co-hosting tonight's event. This is actually really exciting because normally we are talking to all of you about lots of bad things that are happening in Harrisburg and how we need you to help fight, uh, get a governor's veto. We need to defeat some bill. Somebody's attacking something in a courthouse. We actually get to sit before you all and talk about lots of great things. The state budget that just passed last week is truly historic. And it comes to us after years and in some cases, decades of work um, by these organizations, by the membership, volunteers, folks signing letters, talking to their legislators, making phone calls. But at the end of the day, we ended up with over $900 million of environmental investments made in the state budget, plus new rules to regulate pollution coming from uh, fertilizers and a lot of other really interesting and, and critical programs. We're just starting to see some of that reach the, the media. So you're going to hear some good tidbits and facts today from our panelists. But I, I think everybody that's on this, we have over 100 um, attendees right now for the webinar, should just take a good victory lap. I mean, we did this. We did this momentum, momentous thing in Pennsylvania in 2022. There's a lot going wrong in the world today. You know, the feeling is nothing's going to go right. Things are going sour. Uh, we can't do big things anymore as a country. We just did a big thing as Pennsylvania, and we should relish that, that fact. So uh, the panelists are going to give a lot of details about what was in the budget. Um, but just pat yourself on the back. And Molly, Molly's going to talk to you all about uh, kind of the, how bipartisan na in nature this was. Uh, this wasn't just something that was forced through the budget. This came through with overwhelming support, something that we haven't seen in the Commonwealth in a very, very long time. So thank you again to all of you for your support of these issues, of our organizations. Thanks for showing up. Uh, and thanks to all the organizations that are present on, on, the, on the panel. Uh, none of this would have been possible without you. So Molly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matt. Greetings, everyone. My name is Molly Parson, and I'm the Executive Director at Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania. And I'm so excited to be here today. As Matt said, we truly can't understate just what an important and historic moment we're in right now. And I think that you all know that these investments couldn't have come too soon. Uh, one of the things that makes me really optimistic and excited about the moment we're in is, as Matt said, the true bipartisan nature of this. When the American Rescue Plan and federal dollars showed up on our doorstep uh, during the pandemic, I think there was a lot of debate about what to do with them. And it turns out what bubbled to the surface as an issue that both Democrats and Republicans across the aisle could agree was absolutely crucial to spend this money on was conservation and the environment. And I think that really in a time 
that we're living in right now where everything feels so polarized and so partisan and so um, intransigent and impossible to get things done. When you look at the gridlock in Washington, when you look at the fact that Governor Wolf consistently just has to veto bad bill after bad bill coming out of the legislature, then you have a moment like this where folks across the aisle are able to actually come together and work to compile a budget that makes serious and long overdue investments in conservation and the environment. It sends a tremendous statement that these issues matter. These issues affect all Pennsylvanians, regardless of where they live, what district they're in, you know, where they recreate, how they use their, their built and, and natural environment. And I think that the folks in Harrisburg recognized that and, uh, and put their money where their mouths were, so to speak, making these really historic uh, and impactful investments. Like Matt said, I want to just thank everyone so much for all of the work that each of you have done, whether it was writing a letter or picking up the phone or going on a lobby visit. All of that work for so many years led to this moment. There's more work to do, obviously, there's always more work to do, but it's very rare, especially in Pennsylvania, especially in the environment we're in right now, that we get a true bipartisan win on all of our issues. And so, like Matt said, that is absolutely worth celebrating uh, before we move on to the next fight, and I know y'all be with us on that. I am going to turn it over to my colleagues to give you so much fantastic detail about all the exciting new things that we're going to see out of this budget. So I'm very pleased to introduce Ezra Thrush, who is the Senior Director of Government Affairs at Penn Future, and Katie Bloom, who is the Political Director at Conservation Voters of PA. Thanks, Molly. Um, just so you can all see, we also have a list here of our other guests who will be speaking about budget specifics today. But I'm going to start because you never know how much somebody understands about how things work in Pennsylvania is we're going to kind of do a how the budget is made 101. Very simple. Um, you'll see two quotes on there. That is true. Um, we were actually at the table on parts of this budget and we had success on it. Uh, another thing to realize is there are lots of anti-environment forces out there. There is not going to be a 100% perfect budget but I will say this is one of the best budgets that I have seen in a long time overall um, with some wonderful investments. And some of that is due to the uh, $12 billion surplus, some of which was American Rescue Plan funds, as well as just normal state revenue surplus. So we're very excited about that. And we'll go into a timeline. Michael? Um, this might be a little bit hard to read um, on your screen. Enlarge it if you can. Uh, you can hit a button on your Zoom to kind of blow the screen up if you need to. Um, but the budget process is a year-round process. We cannot minimize that. If you see here, um, we are going in right now. Um, even though Governor Wolf's term is going to be ending this year, we are looking at agencies already preparing for next year's budget. So they're going to be factoring in successful and unsuccessful programs where they need more staffing, where they need more funding, and they're going to start factoring all of this out over the next couple of months. Um, the governor in 2023 is going to do a budget address towards the beginning of the year. There's going to be financial projections about state revenue over the course of the next six to nine months. Um, and then after the governor's budget address, um, after the new year, we are going to have lots and lots and lots and lots of hearings. Um, and that kind of susses out some detail about agency plans. Um, you get to hear through those hearings what legislators might be thinking about what their priorities are as well. Um, and the big excitement comes in June. And this year it went into July. They must pass a budget every year by midnight on June 30th. 
Um, if it goes too long, if we're talking weeks without a budget, then we can start saying things like shutdown. But a week is in the grand scheme of Pennsylvania budget fights actually is not bad, um, considering some that we have had. And I will say that the people who make the decisions before even those of us on the call see what's going to be in that final budget language, we see um, really appropriations chairs um, in both the House and Senate, um, leadership of both parties in the House and Senate, along with the governor's office and some of the governor's staff, really diving in and keeping a lot of those early negotiations very closed. Um, for example, uh, Leader McClinton, uh, the minority chair in the House, she's been hearing from her members through the hearing process. Um, so she knows what to go in and what where she can can fight, where she can wiggle a little bit, et cetera. Next slide. I'm going to let Ezra talk about this year's budget package. Hey, thanks, folks. Uh, Ezra Thrush here, Senior Director of Government Affairs with Penn Future. I work really closely with Katie in the building. Just want to talk about the next steps of the budget package and what happens and what happened this year. Uh, so every budget package, it's not just one bill. A lot of folks think that it's uh, just one appropriations bill, uh, but really the budget is 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 uh, three or four or five or six different bills put together in a package. They all have to be passed together. So uh, at, first of all, you'll have what's referred to as the budget is really the spending plan. That's the general appropriations bill. This year, the general appropriations bill was Senate Bill 1100. Uh, <clears throat> the prime sponsor of that bill was Senator Pat Brown, and Pat Brown is the majority chair for appropriations in the state Senate. Uh, you might have might have heard that he didn't win his reelection bid in the primary in May, so this is his last budget. He'll be leaving at the end of November this year. So that kind of added uh, another layer of complexity, uh, complex layer. Uh, to the budget negotiations this year. It was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, the other bills that we saw this year, we, we saw an election code bill pass. We saw a school code bill pass and a human services code bill pass. These code bills, they're called code bills. And what they do is each of them implement some policy that directs how the money's getting spent, how it's, where it's going. Uh, and if there's any policy issues that come up in the course of negotiations or anything that needs to be updated, uh, for federal regulations or implementation of federal dollars or any kinds of uh, any kind of needs that the uh, the executive agencies need, uh, they'll do that work in the code bills. So again, human services, uh, uh, school code, and election code. Those are often not bills that we track. Although I will say, just uh, just to clarify a part there, Katie's Katie's organization and my organization, Pin Future and CVPA, we are very interested in election code. I'll let Katie speak to that a little bit on. You'll hear a little bit about that more and more. We're needing to fight back against attacks on voting rights and democracy issues in Harrisburg, and it's all connected. Really, we need a strong environmental policy, and we believe to get there, we need strong uh, uh, civic participation in democracy and voting rights. So Katie, uh, Katie will have a longer story about that in a bit. But, uh, but so we followed the election code a little bit. The other code bills that we followed in this package uh, are the tax code bill and the fiscal code bill. Now, typically, we'll also have an administrative code bill. The administrative code bill will set up new, uh, new uh, programs or new funds, or they'll have different uh, directing language for agencies that you don't see in the other, the other code bills. Uh, we didn't have an administrative code bill th this year. We only had a fiscal code and a tax code. Anytime you have a tax code bill in a budget package, that basically means there's going to be some kind of change in the tax law, whether it's some kind of subsidy or tax credit or uh, a break given to somebody or something, or some kind of uh, or some kind of uh, a gift or, or present to an industry, a business, a sector, a company, um, or NGOs that are out there. Anybody who who has uh, who's taxable by by the Commonwealth, you'll find those things in the tax code. Um, and I wanted to just mention the, the last bit is the fiscal code. And fiscal code is the most important for us oftentimes. You'll see a lot of uh, our, our issues in environmental policy find its way into the fiscal code, both good and bad. So this year, 
a lot of the directing language that creates our new programs and 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 and, and spends the money that we we were able to get secure the investments for this year in the budget package that language is all found in the fiscal code this year the fiscal code is house bill 1421 and it's from representative wendy thomas from bucks county uh, and so we had language in the fiscal code this year that set up uh, more monies uh, for conservation, setting up a new uh, energy program uh, for housing. We'll hear more about that soon, but that's all found in the fiscal code. Uh, sometimes we'll find nefarious things there too. Uh, fortunately enough, we had heard about a, a couple of bad policy writers, environmental policy writers that folks were trying to put into the budget, into the code, fiscal code bill. Uh, thankfully, uh, Governor Wolf and our legislative allies were able to uh, remove those from the negotiating table on the fiscal code, and they were able to run outside of the budget or, or be taken off the, the table altogether. So we're thankful for that. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to note with the tax code bill, uh, there was a part in the tax code bill, House Bill 1342 from Representative Jack Rader from Monroe County. Uh, there was a bill that uh, there's a provision in that bill that removes a, a, a state tax credit cap uh, to try to incentivize more data centers to come to Pennsylvania. And our analysis is that uh, increased data centers in Pennsylvania means uh, more Bitcoin and crypto mining coming to waste coal facilities in Pennsylvania. That's a, an emerging issue at Penn Future. We've been doing a lot of messaging on this issue. Uh, so uh, we're watching out for that and, uh, and we're hopeful that uh, that we don't have more Bitcoin and crypto coming here. We'll be pushing back against that. But that's just a flag I wanted to say about the tax code bill. With that, I'm going to kick it back over to you, Katie, for the next part. Yeah, um, this is kind of wrapping up a little bit of our, I don't think we have another slide after this. Um, although I do want to say thank you to Michael for putting these together. I saw the graphic on this particular slide. I might want to break out into song and start singing, I'm just a bill. Um, but the one thing I did want to flag, uh, we did get a question in about how it, it vote, how people vote on the budget. Um, the governor does present his budget desires, correct? You know, that's what the budget address is about. But the House and Senate do full votes on it. So let's say the House, um, I'm going to go with Senate Bill 1100. The Senate votes on that. The House has to concur which means they have to vote in agreement the same bill. Now, if the House wants to add something and they want to add another line item in there, then it has to go back to the Senate for the Senate to all vote and agree on that and concur again. Once both chambers vote on the bill for final passage, we call it third and final passage, um, then that goes to the governor's desk for signature. So hopefully that answers the question that we got. Um, and actually, at this point, I'm going to kick it over back to Ezra to talk about clean streams and fertilizer and sea pace. Hey, thanks, Katie. So uh, a big part of the budget package we got th this year in water infrastructure are things around the intersection of water quality and agriculture, uh, something that we've been pushing for a lot with other partners in the agriculture, clean water space, uh, hunters and anglers, and uh, outdoor recreation groups uh, was something called the Clean Streams Fund. This was House Bill 1901 by Representative Jonathan Hershey from, uh, from Juniata County. In the House, in the Senate side, it was Senate Bill 832 from John, uh, Senator Eugene Yaw from Lycoming County. He's the chair for Senate Environmental Resources and uh, Energy Committee. And uh, this bill was really important. We've been pushing for quite some time. Uh, with, with a host of different uh, organizations. I know some organization representatives are on this call who are part of the fight, and we thank you for your help and your partnership. Um, uh, this is something that we've been working on for quite some time. The idea is to set up a new agriculture cost share program. Pennsylvania doesn't have anything like it, and uh, it's been something that we've been trying to set up in Pennsylvania for quite some time. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency has called on the Commonwealth to put in place something like this and to be fully funded by uh, by the legislature, but for so long it's been pretty elusive. Um, uh, so this is a way of setting up an agriculture cost share program, uh, a way to match funds that will go to farmers and private landowners to do conservation work. 
we realize that water pollution is everybody's issue. It's not just uh, individual farmers. Uh, you know, you might know that agriculture source runoff pollution is, is the second leading source of, of pollution in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we, we're trying to do everything we can to help out. Instead of pointing fingers, we need to come in in the trenches together with folks and uh, pass pass funding legislation to get money out the door so we have more projects, uh, conservation projects implemented. So this sets up a program similar to uh, the Dirt and Gravel Road program uh, that's currently housed at the State Conservation Commission. Uh, the name of this program is called the Agriculture Conservation Assistance Program, or ACAP for short. Agriculture Conservation Assistance Program. And this is something the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and a lot of environmental conservation groups across the state, we've all been working together on, which is really cool uh, because it doesn't happen often. Uh, so that's really just a great example of that, that work and that, that, that collaboration. Uh, so this money would be, uh, would be spent through the State Conservation Commission working with the county conservation districts. The county conservation districts would then contract with farmers and private landowners to get the money into uh, into the landowners and farmers to do the projects. So this will be uh, seen as uh, tree buffer plantings next to streams or waterways that abut properties. Um, this would also be uh, could also be used for stream bank fencing to help keep livestock out of the stream. And that's really important because uh, that could increase erosion and sedimentation issues. Uh, that's one of our sources of, of pollution in Pennsylvania, along with nitrogen and phosphorus, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Another leading source is sedimentation and erosion uh, in, in the waters. Uh, and we can also use this money for modernizing barnyards and replacing manure lagoons and those kinds of things. Um, so this is something that uh, folks in the agriculture and environmental conservation world have been working on for quite some time. The rest of this money uh, in the Clean Streams Fund, there's a new clean water procurement program uh, that'll be a pay for success kind of uh, kind of program, uh, which which is pretty ex exciting. There's some money for acid mine drainage cleanup. There's some more money that goes to the Keystone Tree Fund that was set up a few years ago, uh, and that effort was led by our partners and friends at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And there's also additional money. Uh, for municipal stormwater uh, management improvements. And so that's that's all really exciting. We don't have a program or a pot of money that's just for that right now. Uh, so this this sets up a new a new uh, issue for stormwater stormwater funding, which is really exciting. Along with the Clean Streams Fund getting put into the state budget, uh, the funding for the in the in this general appropriations bill, and then the directing language in the um, uh, the fiscal code from ARPA, we also were able to pass another bill that's really important for, for agriculture and water. Uh, this is the fertilizer bill, and I'm sorry, not agriculture. This is the commercial and residential sector. Uh, so the fertilizer bill is something that a lot of us have been working on for 12 years or so. Uh, this is a bill that just updates the regulations and expectations and guidelines for uh, fertilizer application on commercial and residential properties. There is an agriculture and municipal exemption, but this is mostly for folks' uh, lawns at home. This is for schools, golf courses, uh, those kinds of properties, commercial properties that have a lot of land and use fertilizer. So our leading source of, of runoff right now is nitrogen and, and phosphorus causing, causing a lot of problems. And the more nitrogen and phosphorus that we have going to our streams, creeks, and rivers causes more deoxification, harmful algal blooms, and just degrades the water quality in Pennsylvania. So we had heard from the Environmental Protection Agency that if we pass this bill, maybe even within the next year, we will see real tangible results in our water quality, especially according to nitrogen and phosphorus, which is really exciting. This bill sets up application standards. Uh, there's labeling requirements on, on uh, the fertilizer, which is something that manufacturers of fertilizer in the age, the industry and fertilizer, they're all on board with. A lot of the states around us already have this legislation and they already have special requirements at their states. So these companies think it makes sense and it's, and it's a common sense idea. This bill also sets up uh, some uh, application requirements and training expectations. And uh, we'll be working to add a certification element to this probably this fall, but it's a big win, something that a lot of us, especially in the Bay Water should have been working on. Uh, and I just wanted to mention one more win uh, that flew underneath the radar, but we've been working on this for quite some time is to expand a program called the Clean, I'm sorry, the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. And it's a really good program to build out energy efficiency in the state. Uh, before it was just commercial, now it's multifamily residential and there's a water component too. 
So I know a lot of the groups in, in the environmental community, in, in the conservation community have been working on this for quite some time. Uh, I know our partners at the Keystone Energy Efficiency Alliance and Green Building United have been working on this and leading the charge, but I wanted to just uh, to, to shout out uh, the, big, the big win in expanding Pennsylvania's commercial property assessed clean energy program. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to my colleague, uh, Brad Barkdahl, who's the advocacy manager that we can serve you. Hey, thank you, Ezra. I appreciate uh, the comments you just had there on the immense successes that we've had so far. Um, as Ezra mentioned, my name is Brad Barkdahl. I am the advocacy manager for We Can Serve PA, um, formerly known as the Pennsylvania Land Trust Association. But uh, here at We Can Serve, we are also the managing partner of the Growing Greener Coalition, which uh, Growing Greener is what I'm going to give you guys a little insight on. So a little background on Growing Greener. The program has actually been around for 23 years. It has had immense bipartisan support throughout those 23 years. It was first created in 1999 under Governor Ridge, and then Growing Greener 2 came about in 2006. And here over the last couple of years, we have been heavily advocating for the third iteration of Growing Greener that we've been calling Growing Greener 3. Um, two pieces of legislation, both identical in the House and Senate. The first is House Bill 2020 by Representative Culver, and the second is Senate Bill 525 from Senator Gordoner. Uh, both of them, as I mentioned, are identical in nature, asking for American Rescue Plan dollars to be allocated to the Environmental Stewardship Fund for all things outdoor recreation and outdoor infrastructure. And just in brief, a portion of it was for the DCNR for their state parks and state forests and that infrastructure, an allocation for the DEP for acid mine drainage and abandoned mine cleanup and just additional water quality and purification issues, and then some for the Department of Agriculture for farmland preservation and conservation. So uh, this year, something that we all had a little bit of a chuckle at as we were skimming through the budget trying to find where Growing Greener was, uh, luckily, we all got a little heads up that the legislators uh, changed the name on us in the budget to something they call the State Park and Outdoor Recreation Program. So if you happen to hear it labeled that, that is still growing greener. Um, but for all intents and purposes right now, we're just going to stick to calling it growing greener. Um, so this year, growing greener traditionally for the uh, DCNR received 100 million from the American Rescue Plan dollars. And then on top of that, an additional $56 million were allocated from the oil and gas lease fund, totaling $156 million for the traditional growing greener side of things. And as previously mentioned, that's for state parks, for state forests. Uh, one thing we've been mentioning throughout our meetings here in Harrisburg is that with the pandemic and people getting outside and utilizing the resources that the state has to offer, it's kind of highlighted the infrastructure needs that our facilities have. And also in conversation with, you know, those folks over at the DCNR alone, they're sitting on a $1.5 billion backlog. So these funds are going to really help them get on their feet and get a jump on some of this backlog that they have. Um, another side of things that we're ecstatic about is significant funding for water infrastructure money across the state. In total, we received $320 million dollars for these water infrastructure programs. So that's upgrading stormwater infrastructure, um, piping a lot of old you know, towns and municipalities across the Commonwealth still have terracotta pipes, getting those up to you know, the quality they need to be to help improve drinking water and all things that just go into that side of the you know, water infrastructure across the state. So that 320 million is gonna be divvied up between the DEP, the Commonwealth Finance Authority, CFA, and PennVest. So if you put these two totals together, the 156 million and the 320 million, you're left with a whopping $476 million, which is a fantastic investment in the infrastructure for the environment of Pennsylvania. And you know we're ecstatic about this and we're just really excited to see how Pennsylvania is gonna benefit from these historic investments. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Hi Garst, to discuss some more of the successes that we've had this year. Thanks, Brad. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hai Garst. I'm the state policy advocate for the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. Uh, our coalition is made up of over 175 members, 84 of which are in Pennsylvania, uh, working together to um, advocate for the watershed and, on, and for the communities within it. Uh, one of our big focuses this year has been thinking about uh, river basin commissions. 
And there are a number of watersheds uh, in Pennsylvania. And, and as a result, Pennsylvania is part of a number of different basin commissions. Pennsylvania is a part of the Ohio River Basin Commission, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, the uh, Great Lakes Commission, and of course, the Delaware River Basin Commission. Now, these river basin commissions uh, are set in as a, a great way to be able to manage a watershed on, a, on over state lines and, and uh, use interstate management to be able to manage the watershed as a whole, rather than have to focus on political boundaries when engaging in management. Uh, when when uh, you, multiple states are, are being governed by this group and are being, uh, being uh, overseen by, by this, uh, these commissions, they're funded by the states. So each state has committed uh, into these commissions to pay a certain amount of money in compacts. So for example, a great deal of our work with CDRW is working with and on the Delaware River Basin Commission and the basin states, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania all pay an agreed upon amount into the commission each year. Now, the issue is that while there is an agreed upon amount, uh, there is no enforcement mechanism to force states to pay that agreed upon amount. So in the case of Pennsylvania, for a number of years, these uh, river basin commissions and watershed commissions have been underfunded by Pennsylvania. And we've had a marvelous ally in Governor Wolf who is um, committed to, to putting full share funding for each of these commissions into his budget every year. But not every year does the uh, legislature follow through on that. So the highlight this year, uh, the big highlight this year is that for the first time in a number of years, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission was funded at its full share level for Pennsylvania. Now the remainder of the commissions were not and a number of things held them up this year, but we saw some big wins in these conversations because we saw for the first time in a while some bipartisan support for uh, the, the well-being of these river basin commissions and for future funding for these river basin commissions. And so we look forward to, to tackling that in the future. Another fund I wanna highlight uh, that uh, was dealt with in this budget process is the Environmental Stewardship Fund. And there are some cases in which uh, when nothing happens around an issue, it's a win in the budget process. And many years, the Environmental Stewardship Fund comes under attack during budget negotiations. The Environmental Stewardship Fund is uh, a collection of funds that come from things like the tipping fee, fees paid for, for garbage dumped in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, that money would go to agencies to be able to, to dish out, to regrant, and to reallocate, uh, to restore farmland, preserve open space, improve water quality, and provide recreation and community uh, investments. This, like I said, has uh, in many years been a negotiating tool. And this year, we did not see uh, any major cuts or any major concern around the Environmental Stewardship Fund, which we're calling a major one. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Katie, to talk about agency funding, whole yes. home repair, and other bad policy writers. Yeah, um, but we've got more good stuff first before the bad. Um, I want to give a shout out in particular to High and Brad uh, for all of the work um, that they have done specifically with agencies. And as some of you might know on this webinar is we constantly hear this refrain. I think the, the usual uh, agency to get this, I mean, and so, frankly, I think it's all of them is, oh, um, well, DEP is not processing my permit fast enough. Well, what happens is we have repeatedly seen cuts to DEP and other agencies over the years, reducing staff, which means maybe longer wait time for a grant to be processed, things like that. So it's really exciting. We are seeing really good increases in three of the more major agencies that the environmental community tends to deal with. The first one is the Department of Ag at about a 29% increase. Um, over the last fiscal year budget, which is about 36, 37 million dollars. Uh, we are looking at an increase with DEP of about 14 million. Um, that is an 8% increase. And for DCNR, we are looking at a 9% increase for just under 13 million dollars. And this was also part of the governor's budget request. Um, he had asked for more, um, where we would be adding, you know, up to 40 new staffers in some places. 
um, just to help with the work. Um, we did not get that full 100% request that the governor made that we were fully supportive of, but we still got substantial increases. And that's really helpful because as we have these programs and new programs like Clean Streams, hopefully some expansion of growing greener type programs, we know that there will be the staff there to help administer that and to help protect and uh, get us out in Pennsylvania's natural resources. The other really exciting thing that we saw, and most people don't necessarily think of this as something environmental, is the whole home repairs bill. Um, there was a wonderful coalition from around the state, and this is another one of those uh, bills that ended up being bipartisan. What it does is it helps folks um, with weatherization, um, grants to homeowners and home agencies, you know, like county housing authorities uh, and groups that do um, state or federally funded weatherization programs. You can get up to $50,000 $50, grants in some cases, um, but it really will boost energy efficiency. Um, we know that weatherization also cuts emissions. And when we look at environmental justice communities across this state, there's one in almost every district, if not more, um, is what happens with some of the more traditional uh, weatherization programs, there's often an income limit. Um, and that can be very difficult for some people to get their homes appropriately weatherized, especially if it requires more work. So a bill like this will really, really help people. Thank you. Um, I just saw Jess put in the chat, us lobbyists are always dropping our acronyms. So yes, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, but whole home repairs is great. Um, and it will really do some stuff um, kind of along with the whole CPACE program that Ezra was talking about a little bit ago. So that's kind of wrapping up the bulk of the good stuff. But I also want to talk about those bad policy riders we mentioned. Uh, one of them you already heard Ezra speak about um, that did make it in the budget um, regarding Bitcoin data centers. But we also, what happens during the budget um, yes, correct, Mitch, you are absolutely correct uh, that some homes aren't necessarily eligible and need more of those repairs. Um, but with the hecticness of budget season, I think we had maybe 24 hours to read the budget max. Um, I think that's being generous. Um, but it, as it is all hectic, what happens is bad bills come out and they keep spitting out bills and filling up their calendars and things like that. And they try to move things thinking nobody else is paying attention because all these other folks are focused on the budget. So two, yes, yes, Ezra, more time to read the budget packet bills than usual um, because of some of this year's shenanigans. Um, we did have uh, two bills that ended up passing the chamber, uh, both chambers. One was Senate Bill 275. Uh, that is a municipal gas preemption bill. And what that would do is, you know, if you're updating zoning codes or anything like that, a, a municipality cannot prevent an energy source in a new development. Um, so if they want to say, well, if you're building this section of townhomes here, um, it can't have gas service, it needs to be electric um, and, and items like that. Or, so the, that did pass the chambers. Uh, Governor Wolf vetoed that this week already. Um, the other bill that has us concerned is House Bill 2644. And this bill relates to um, capping um, old wells. Pennsylvania has a lot, um, and Pennsylvania will be jumping on the federal infrastructure plan monies for this. Um, but the bad part about this bill is it really lets the conventional, and I'm saying conventional, not um, fracking, conventional oil and gas companies to basically not be bonded the way we would normally have a company be bonded. So one of these companies could easily go over, but then the cost for actually doing the work to cap these wells that release 
uh, methane and, and other things still into our air would actually end up being on the backs of taxpayers. And of course, you can find out more about that as well. Um, so those are two of the big ones. We are hoping that Governor Wolf will be vetoing that as well. Um, and I think I'm quickly going to go to Ezra for two other bills in the few that we're going to be looking ahead to, and then I'll wrap with the other things. So Ezra? Yeah, I'll just mention some really good news briefly. Uh, something we've been working on for quite some time, and you might have seen us in emails and other outreach talking about them, are, are some clean energy and climate bills. We've been trying to increase uh, Pennsylvanians' participation in producing, generating their own uh, solar photovoltaic power generation and trying to get more folks involved with solar energy. Uh, right now, it's 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 on the costlier side to, to, to get solar, and a lot of folks in Pennsylvania don't own their homes and their own property. So uh, if we pass uh, community solar legislation that removes some barriers, technical and legal barriers, that allows more people to participate in solar, again, it's called community solar. We've been working on this for quite some time. We had heard in the last week or two of budget session that uh, over the summer, uh, the leaders of the legislature and uh, advocates are gonna hammer something out and, uh, and they're going to pass legislation this fall. We've heard that promise from leaders so we're looking forward to getting that done this fall. We're also looking forward to finally getting done uh, some legislation on EV infrastructure and building out additional charging station network across the state. This would really complement the legislation that passed last year, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act by and signed into law by President Biden. Uh, this, this would really uh, be uh, beneficial and, and complement the federal monies that are coming to Pennsylvania. Uh, there's $171 million coming to the Department of, of Transportation to help with this, but we need to pass uh, uh, this this uh, this bill, Senate Bill 435, the EV infrastructure charging station bill first uh, to build out the charging stations across Pennsylvania so that it's not just the Philadelphia Pittsburgh metro areas, but other markets across the state like Harrisburg, Lancaster, York, Lehigh Valley, uh, Wilkesboro, Scranton, the Poconos, Erie, those, those places need to have more electric vehicle charging stations too. You might know that about a third of our carbon emissions from Pennsylvania come from the transportation sector. So this would help us get along uh, in cutting, cutting back on those emissions. So with that, we're looking forward to taking some rest this summer and meeting with members in, of the legislature and their district offices. But this fall, we're hoping to still get at it and get a couple more wins before this legislative term wraps up on November 30th. So Katie, back to you. Thanks, Ezra. Um, we will be answering your questions. We are compiling them. I'm going to remind my fellow panelists to take a look at the document. Um, also, you can use the chat feature, the Q&A feature. I'm sorry, not the chat, the Q&A to submit your questions as well, if you would like. Um, another thing that we are going to look ahead to, oi, um, are bills like Ezra said earlier, democracy and voting rights. Some of you may have seen uh, work that we were doing very last minute on Senate Bill 106. Uh, that bill contained five different constitutional amendments, two of which dealt directly with um, voting and democracy issues and one um, that was anti-regulatory, um, very much in a response to uh, positive Reggie actions that we've taken. Um, so numerous things in there, um, but I do want to make it very clear, uh, to people who might still be confused about everything that happened as we're also kind of educating on how the process works is that constitutional amendments in Pennsylvania, um, I believe it was since the seventies, Pennsylvania voters have I think all but once or twice voted yes on them. They are almost intentionally worded in ways that voters don't necessarily understand. So a constitutional amendment, when a bill is out there with a constitutional amendment in it, what happens is it has to pass two legislative sessions, consecutive legislative sessions. And our legislative, legislative sessions are two years long. So it'll be January 23 to December um, of 24. Um, so if they pass it now, they could pass it again next year with the same language. And after that, it will end up on the ballot for voters. 
um, and they will be listed on the ballot as five separate questions. Um, and a lot of people ask, why do we care about democracy issues as we do environmental work? Uh, my, my favorite and best line on that is really, we know in the environmental community that an overwhelming majority, over 70% consistently in every poll, some as high as 79 of voters in Pennsylvania believe that we have to do something to address climate change and protect our environment. But those things are not happening um, as it should be in our state legislature. So that means we have to do something about democracy and making sure people are getting out there and making their voices heard. So that's why we care about bills like this. Um, and we are also going to continue to look into the future um, in the fall session um, for other anti-democracy bills. Uh, we will also be looking at other kinds of anti-regulatory bills as we move through the Reggie process. Um, and as we go through all of that, there, there's always a call to deregulate Pennsylvania um, from certain members of the legislature. And clearly those uh, deregulation also has an impact on the environment. So it's something to consider. Um, and at that point, um, I think we will go to questions. Well, thank you all so much, both for the work you've done these past several months to get this really um, amazing package in the budget and for taking the time to, to explain it a little bit today. Um, so we're now going to turn it over to some questions that you have all been submitting for the past hour. The first one I'd like to ask all the panelists is, how will disadvantaged communities benefit from this budget? You want to take that stab, Katie? I am happy to. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of things. First of all, uh, we spoke about whole home repairs. Um, and again, I also said at the beginning of this, um, no budget is perfect. Um, we do want to see uh, future investments in things like public transportation. Histor communities that have been historically disinvested in have less access to public parks, green space, et cetera. So we also see heat zones. Um, there's usually a report that comes out almost every year in Philadelphia about some pretty scary heat zones in the city where there just isn't green space. Um, and we see that in urban areas all over. Um, but it is also about, uh, also for historically disinvested communities, not just, uh, urban communities, but also rural communities are impacted as well. Um, one of my favorite lines that Brad and Hi have, and Ezra have all heard me say is the outdoor recreation economy is critical to rural Pennsylvania where you have um, old little factory towns that are dying with maybe a few hundred residents, but maybe trout fishing is keeping their local economy alive because they're selling um, fishing rods and things like that. So there's a lot of different places. As I mentioned earlier, almost every legislative district has some level of an what we would consider an environmental justice community in it. Um, so there's a whole host of things. Um, and also some of these investments, particularly with upgrading infrastructure uh, with DCNR programs is also going to help with access, um, especially when some parts of a park might have to be closed and then people just don't have access because we can't afford to repair services. Brad, hi, Ezra. That was fantastic, thank you, Katie. And I appreciate the question for highlighting that. Um, so Brad, the next question I'm gonna throw your way, uh, William asked, what is the dollar amount for open space land acquisition in the budget? Uh, so we can serve PA that primarily deals with land acquisition and conservation easements and land trusts. Uh, it's kind of the bread and butter of what we do is land acquisition. So uh, the Growing Greener program, the $156 million will be, you know, a grant program through the DCNR out of the Environmental Stewardship Fund for the land acquisition. So, you know, private landowners that want to preserve a family farm to prevent any development or those that just, you know, own a lot of land that want to prevent any kind of development and preserve it for open space can tap into this Growing Greener program to, uh, you know, preserve the open space. So the $156 million is going to be allocated for programs that will help with that. Anyone else have anything to add to that as well? Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Um, so hi, this next question I'll pass to you first, although Ezra, you also touched it in the, uh, in the chat, which uh, Amy and others asked a lot of questions about the Clean Streams Fund, which is of course a new program. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how much money is in the fund currently and what type of nonprofits can benefit from this new program? Sure thing. So the fund is broken up uh, into three different main points, kind of like Ezra talked about. So the three major uh, issues for clean water in Pennsylvania, agriculture, uh, acid mine runoff, and municipal stormwater issues. So money monies uh, go to that. The number that's, that was put into the Clean Streams was, Fund was about $220 million. And Ezra, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe it was about $220 million. Uh, that this is creating a brand new fund in Pennsylvania. So this is, uh, this is uh, the first program solely dedicated to water protection and improvements. It would address, like I said, these three major issues for water uh, pollution by boosting existing programs and by establishing a lot of new programs. Um, Ezra can talk a little bit more about how nonprofits might be able to benefit from this, but so much of this is going through um, the Agricultural Conservation Assistance Program or ACAP for short, the Nutrient Management Fund for uh, um, also agriculture issues and Municipal Stormwater Assistance Program, which goes straight to municipalities. Trying to take myself off mute here. Hey, uh, so what we what we what we know is that uh, I think the only part of the Clean Streams Fund that would be applicable for for nonprofit organizations would be the Keystone Tree Fund. I know the Clean Water Procurement Program. Uh, the Clean Water Procurement Program might be as well in, in, in companies, businesses. Um, and the ACAP would be for private landowners and farmers, and the stormwater monies would be through municip municipalities getting grants through DEP and PennVest and CFA and those kinds of things. So um, the Keystone Tree Fund uh, for buffer plantings, and then also the monies, uh, the monies for um, a procurement program would be applicable, though most of the time for the procurement program, something similar to that in the past, we've seen corporations and businesses and companies participate there. So uh, it'll be it'll have to shake out in an implementation process when DEP and uh, DCNR and Department of Agriculture, uh, you know, get the money and then they start to implement the programs. And just a quick awesome. clarification that the Keystone tree account uh, it supports DCNR's efforts to the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources efforts to plant riparian, riparian forest buffers, which are tree buffers around stream banks, particularly near agricultural lands. So this would be opportunities for nonprofits, but for also private landowners to apply for funds to be able to do these projects. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Cheryl asked a really great question. Can we have a list of the new programs to take back to our, our communities and local governments? Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, so both Penn Future and Conservation Voters of PA um, drafted statements after the budget passed, which details a lot of the um, a lot of the new programs that were successfully funded. We'll make sure to share a short list of the programs in a follow-up email, and I believe my colleague Jeff is uh, posting that uh, for folks to take a look at. But yes, um, we're also planning at Penn Future a blog that will go into a little more uh, depth about some of the. Um, some of the new programs that have been built. But yes, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so John asked, and uh, Katie, I think I'll throw this to you. Uh, what were the major factors that led to this bipartisan historic budget? Um, did it have to do with demand for outdoor green spaces, uh, the election this year, uh, constituents of all political persuasions pushing for legislators to enhance the environment, uh, all the above? I would like to say that it is really because of the four of us on this panel and our superb lobbying skills. Um, but um, it's actually a lot of the latter. Um, Senator Gordner um, uh, actually is, uh, Senate is only up, half the Senate is up every four years, so they rotate. Senator Gordner is actually not up for re-election this year. His re-election was in 2020. Um, and obviously, uh, Representative Culver um, as well. Um, and uh, Senator Nikhil Saval, Democrat from Philadelphia, um, with whole home repairs, um, got that through and he was elected in 2020. So he's not up yet either. So it was really a lot of forces coming together. Um, the Growing Greener Coalition, people mobilizing 
uh, through groups um, and other tables with whole home repairs, um, our water coalition folks uh, steering things and really bringing people from all walks of life on board. Um, and we are grateful for the, we know that the environment, especially when you're looking at national news media seems very partisan, but um, our natural resources are important to a lot of people on both sides of the aisle here in the state. Thank you so much. Um, John and others have asked about Reggie or the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, first, did the budget have any effect on Reggie in Pennsylvania? And then second, does Senate Bill 106 contain a constitutional amendment that would allow the legislature to override the governor on bill or on issues like Reggie? I can take the first stab at that and maybe Katie, if you want to clean up. Um, so the budget itself does not mention Reggie anywhere. It doesn't mention the carbon trading credit program that that Pennsylvania just entered into. Uh, you might know that we entered into it officially at the end of April uh, and the regulation became uh, became active in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Officially, we started participating on July 1st. Now there's a bit of a hiccup. There was just a preliminary injunction granted by the Commonwealth Court that's currently being appealed. Uh, so that process will continue in the courts for a little bit of time yet. Uh, but in the meantime, all of our legal and energy experts and attorneys believe that we're still participating state in regional greenhouse gas initiative, Reggie. The budget itself doesn't mention Reggie at all. Uh, I had heard uh, from negotiators that there was an attempt to put a one-year moratorium on Pennsylvania participating in Reggie, uh, but that attempt was defeated during negotiations. So uh, we're thankful to the governor and legislative leaders for pushing back against that attempt. Uh, they were able to block that from getting put into the budget package, which is which is big. Uh, we had heard uh, that there were folks interested in one year moratorium on Reggie for quite some time. So that's big. But the budget itself is clean from anything impacting Reggie. Uh, what I will say is uh, probably later this year, maybe later this fall, we'll start to talk about Reggie investments. Um, the DEP is coming up with a plan for Reggie investments. Uh, and also, I know the General Assembly has a few bills out there, specifically from Senator Kamita, Representative Heron, uh, that a lot of our organizations are supportive of to talk about investments of the Reggie funding uh, and Reggie allocations that would come, uh, the proceeds that would come from the auction. Uh, and the auction, the first auction that Pennsylvania could participate in uh, would be in September. So. So that's where we are. Uh, that's where we are now. Uh, but nothing in the budget itself impacts Reggie. Now, I will say that the part of SB 106 that Katie was talking about, uh, that language, that language would say that uh, for the regulatory process that goes through the ERC or Independent Regulatory Review Commission, and then the General Assembly, both chambers of the General Assembly, has to approve or disapprove a regulation. Uh, a General Assembly would be able to disapprove a regulation, and then instead of the governor getting a shot to veto it, like he has been thus far through the Regulatory Review Act, uh, the, the governor would no longer be able to veto any kind of disapproval of a regulation. So that disapproval of the regulation would be live, and the governor would no longer be able to do anything about it. So I'll stop there, Katie, if you have anything else. Yeah, and the reason this is uh, pretty scary to us, and it should be for a people who deal with any kind of regulations, not just environmental regulations. Think about um, food safety, health safety, et cetera. This banking uh, has regulations in the state is that that gives the legislature an unequal level of power between our three branches. Should I say, no, we don't like that. And the likelihood of a legislature, even if it changes the next term, of going back and rectifying that is actually probably unlikely. So it's pretty scary and it's a substantial shift um, in the balance of powers between our um, our branches of government here in state. So. Well, thank you all so much. Unfortunately, we're at time for questions, but we have been collecting all of them. So if we did not get to your question, tonight. Don't worry, we're going to share them with all the panelists and do our best to get um, you the answers to those questions. But once again, thank you everyone, uh, Ezra, Katie, uh, hi and Brad, so much for, for this really informative um, uh, presentation tonight.
Um, now, for all of us at home, we know that uh, this budget was a victory because all of us took the time to get involved. And we know if we're going to continue forward, we need to keep getting involved. Um, my colleague's going to uh, post some links in the chat of ways to volunteer with Conservation Lawyers of PA and with Penn Future. And we'll also share that in the follow-up email. Uh, and we really encourage you to take a look at them as um, they're really uh, valuable ways to get involved. We also have some upcoming uh, events if you enjoyed today's presentation that we think you might like. First, uh, by We Can Serve PA, uh, are gonna be having a conversation with Nathan Ringer, Pennsylvania's first director of outdoor recreation to discuss the significance of outdoor recreation in Pennsylvania and to share thoughts and questions about how we can put outdoor recreation to work for sustainable development of our Commonwealth economy and uh, communities. Uh, we Can Serve PA is also gonna be hosting an event, uh, the Leave No Trace Trainer course, which will emphasize the skills and techniques essential to Leave No Trace minimum out in impact outdoor recreation practices and education. Uh, the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed is going to be having their 10th annual forum, uh, and at their forum will feature a mix of engaging speakers, facilitated direct, uh, discussions, um, and ways to work towards um, shared watershed priorities and field trips. And then finally, Conservation Voters of PA next week is going to be hosting an exciting event where we'll be looking on ways that um, the transformative federal legislation uh, that is currently being discussed in Congress. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, explain the latest on what's going on with that and ways that you can get involved. Um, and so that should be posted as well. Thank you all so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And um, we hope you have a great rest of your evening.